Good afternoon from Jerusalem. It's 4 p.m. and this is day nine following the Hamas ISIS-like massacre of Israeli children, women, men, and soldiers last uh, Shabbat, last Saturday. And uh, here we are already nine days out into the uh, into the war, full, it's a full-blown full war against the Hamas-dominated uh, uh, Gaza Strip. And the updates are that uh, we're standing uh, uh, right now uh, with massive uh, air and a massive air campaign by the Israeli Air Force targeting the Hamas leadership, uh, their uh, their main weapons depositories, ammunition depositories their uh, main headquarters uh, in especially in the northern Gaza Strip and as we will report to you and contextualize what's happening the Hamas are actually killing their own people who are trying to flee uh, at Israel at the at Israel's behest offering them humanitarian warnings to move out of the northern Gaza Strip so they avoid uh, avoid uh, any kind of uh, uh, injury to themselves and Hamas is actively preventing their own public from moving out of harm's way. And we will uh, tell you much more about that as we move forward today. We're going to update you uh, now and uh, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Attorney Maurice Hirsch uh, to my left, my esteemed colleague and friend. And we're very honored today to have another esteemed colleague and friend, a, a, a senior fellow of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, the uh, United Kingdom's former senior commander uh, in Afghanistan, British forces, that Colonel Richard Kemp is with us, uh, and he will create a context, comparative context, uh, comparing and contrasting his experience as uh, Britain's senior commander in Afghanistan, fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, to what is happening today in Gaza with the ISIS uh, lookalike, the ISIS uh, essentially modeled Hamas. Uh, as we move forward, uh, Colonel Kemp is actually in his car driving back from the northern border where he has uh, been involved in uh, in consultations and uh, uh, advising uh, as well as uh, what they call uh, in Hebrew arachat matzav which is a an evaluation an evaluation a situation. a situation evaluation of the current situ of, of the situation uh, in the north thank you very much for joining us from across from across the ocean uh, we're fun. really again we're going to uh, do everything we can to create context, analysis, assessment. Take your comments and questions as well. Maurice, a quick update. Where are we in terms of numbers? Uh, dead, wounded, captured, uh, kidnapped. Where, where, what's the status? Okay, so Dan, so let's uh, go through it. We, we're talking about 1,400 people, uh, Israelis and, uh, and, and foreigners who were killed in that initial attack by um, the, the, the Hamas ISIS uh, uh, terrorists. And uh, um, of them, there are still several hundred down that haven't yet been even identified because of the states of their bodies. I'm sure people have seen pictures of, of, of how the terrorists left the scene. Um, that is creating not a small amount of, of difficulties. We also have 3,500 plus injured that are still being treated in the hospitals around, uh, uh, around Israel. Um, and another 150, probably even more, that have been abducted by Hamas. And the other terrorists who participated, we heard uh, as we updated the other day, um, also the PFLP was involved in in this attack and, and also took Israeli hostages. We know that for sure that the PFLP... We know that for sure that the PFLP was involved and took hostages and that they are not subject to the authority of Hamas, also in the conversations yeah. that are going on about releasing uh, the terrorists. Just remind people, the PFLP is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is a Marxist-Leninist terror group that was established uh, along with the, uh, uh, along with, in 1968, frankly, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, extraordinarily they have been present in the Gaza Strip. They're quite present in Judea and Samaria, uh, parts of uh, the former West Bank of Jordan. And so you have here, the Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the PFLP. This is uh, constituent members of the PLO. So yes, yeah, is... PFLP is part of the PLO. Yeah. They are member groups of the, of the PLO that is headed by Mahmoud Abbas, um, the head of the Palestinian Authority. We'll talk just a little bit about it in, in a second. Um, we're talking about um, today alone, dozens of rockets that have been fired from Gaza. They continue to fire rockets just a, 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 an hour and a half ago. 
There was a salvo of rockets towards Tel Aviv, Herzliya, Ramat Hasharon. For those of you unfamiliar, these are Israel's main population centers. Hundreds of thousands, if not more people running, being sent um, to their uh, uh, bomb shelters. Um, of some of the terrorists that have been taken out, um, that's also somewhat good news. We have Ali Qadi. Ali Qadi was in charge of the, the Nukba, the, 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 the Hamas special forces that attacked through the center of the Gaza Strip. His uh, um, uniqueness is that this is a terrorist who was released in the Gilad Shalit deal in 2011. This is a terrorist who continues to receive a payment from the Palestinian Authority for his involvement in terror while he was commanding forces to kill and murder and, uh, uh, and butcher more Jews. Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, was paying his salary, funding his daily uh, uh, living. Um, as uh, you already mentioned, the Gazan authorities, the Hamas authorities, are preventing the, the Gazans from traveling south, whilst they've already received specific uh, um, orders to, to evacuate the northern area. Um, for those of you that have seen, um, there have been several hundreds of targets already attacked by Israel. We're not talking about uh, um, arbitrary tar targets, but rather targets which were military targets, part of Hamas's, not only the leadership, not only their stockpiles, but their entire military basis and their entire military infrastructure. We saw pictures of uh, um, troops coming, Palestinian, uh, Hamas troops, um, coming out of all types of hiding places and subterranean tunnels. All of these targets need to be attacked before the Israeli forces go in. That is a, a legitimate part of the fight of Israel against these terrorists. There's no reason why Israel should have to uh, endanger any of its ground forces and the covering fire that can go with them um, should help. Um, these are the main things. Just one last point, Dan. Two documents that have been uh, um, recovered from the scenes of these massacres on the bodies of the Hamas terrorists point to the fact that even though Hamas tried to deny that it was its forces uh, that carried out the, the massacre, really there were in clear instructions of what to do, a clear order of actions, including take hostages, burn the houses, murder the hostages, rape all, the women, rape the women, all written in Hamas documents that came along with the forces yeah. and have now been seized. So that little bit of fake news that came out of uh, the mouth of Salah Haruri, um, one of the heads of Hamas, um, should be taken exactly as it and is, it, just a blatant lie. And it also should be mentioned, um, Maurice, uh, and we'll talk about this with uh, with Luke, uh, with uh, Colonel Kemp, that the, the Hamas had very detailed, very specific maps uh, and intelligence about, about almost every home in all of the 25 kibbutzim, towns, villages and cities. I mean, they, they invaded cities. I mean, Sterot was so, invaded, yeah. Ofakim was invaded. So this was a violent invasion and, and takeover with very specific intelligence, maps, satellite images uh, to the very street of each individual town. So it, it points to a much larger strategic uh, uh, invasion than we had seen any time in the past. This is way beyond the Hamas. Without going into details, obviously, Dan, there are also some uh, um, reports coming out of strategic <laughs> capabilities that a terrorist organization by itself doesn't have, and that would require state involvement. Um, obviously, we know the elephant um, in the room directing all of these uh, activities is Iran. And uh, so uh, we'll, at the moment, we can leave it at that. We'll leave it at that, but we'll just make one, one mention that Amir Bar Shalom is one of the top military affairs reporters in Israel, reported this morning that there were uh, voices in Farsi, in Persian, that were heard in the invasion and in the massacre in these uh, villages, as well as in Gaza itself, reports that came back from Gaza, that they are part of the kidnapping forces there. So there is a strong... Uh, sense that there are IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the, that's, the, that's the terror arm and the Quds Force of the uh, Iranian regime on the ground in Gaza. So let's turn uh, to uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, JCPA senior fellow and former British commander in Afghanistan. Richard, it's, a, it's really great to have you here in Israel. Unfortunately or unfortunately, you, you've been here for many of our conflicts 
uh, helping us think through some of the some of the international and other uh, military issues. Um, how do you how do you uh, make sense of what you witnessed uh, on uh, last Saturday, the, a week before this, uh, as a, a military man who's seen a lot of conflict and, and a lot of violence in your in your uh, career? Thank you very much, Dan. And um, first of all, I'd like to say it would be a pleasure to be joining you today. If it wasn't in such awful circumstances, but it's always it's always good to be working alongside the JCPA. And secondly, I'd like to apologise for doing this from my car. I was hoping to be sitting with you down in Jerusalem now, but uh, I've been up in the north today and Hezbollah had other ideas and um, my, my movements were pretty severely disrupted, obviously not as, uh, as bad for me as for other people who suffered, including at least one person killed by Hamas, uh, by a big pardon, by Hezbollah anti-tank fire in the north, not far from where, where uh, I was today. Um, in, in terms of the, the uh, horrific events last weekend, um, it's almost hard to find words to describe the horror of them. The nearest comparisons I can think of are two things. First of all, the Einsatzgruppen, the SS Einsatzgruppen that used to prowl around Eastern Europe, going into villages, dragging Jews out, shooting them out of hand. And it's, it's, there were so many echoes of the Holocaust, in a, obviously on a much smaller scale, but still horrific scale that I saw uh, in the footage I've seen from those attacks. And the second, the second uh, comparison I'd make is with the Islamic State. We haven't seen anything in the world, in my view, of, of such brutality and violence since the heyday of the Islamic State, when they were killing, torturing, burning alive, um, kidnapping, raping people around the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and in Syria. And, and this is reminiscent of that. Um, and, and I think that the, the, uh, if anything, if anything, the, the, there was an even in some of the footage I've seen, in some of the photographs I've seen, even greater joy and pleasure taken by the terrorists in spilling Jewish blood, even greater than I saw in the, uh, my experience of Islamic State. And it's, they lit literally, these people were raping and murdering men, women, children, babies, cutting heads off, burning alive, and enjoying doing it, enjoying doing it. That was one of the more chilling aspects of the whole thing. I, I have uh, taken part in the fight against Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. And I think, again, there are comparisons between the two. Um, Islamic State, as everyone knows, was an offshoot of Al Qaeda and, and shared a great deal of their ideology and their lust for blood and their pleasure in killing as well. Um, and, and very clearly, we've, we're seeing a similar, we've, we saw a similar thing last weekend. Uh, around the Gaza Strip, and I think it's it, it really does go to show the. Uh, I think above everything else, I don't think very many people in Israel, certainly people who watch this situation, such as yourselves, closely. I don't think this came as necessarily a huge surprise, because most of us know most of us know that what or knew what Hamas was like, what they were capable of doing. We knew they were butchers. We knew they were, they acted inhumanly, not only to their enemies, but also to their own people inside the Gaza Strip. We knew that. Most of the world didn't believe that. Most of the world preferred to think of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, PFLP, the other, the other Palestinian terrorists, as people who could negotiate with, you could do a deal with. These are people eventually who could uh, help create a two-state solution. But it was never on the cards. It was never a possibility. And I, I would hope that these horrors have demonstrated to those naive people, peace processors, and the other naive people who think that Hamas is an organization that can be negotiated with. Hamas's founding charter makes clear their existence is 
for one thing, and that is to destroy Israel and to kill Jews everywhere. It's very clear, laid out in black and white in their charter. And of course, many people who don't understand the situation, many people who were perhaps optimistic about what could happen, uh, knew that, they read it, but they didn't believe it. They thought, yeah, this again is sort of rhetoric for the consumption of their own followers. It was far from that, in the same way as with Islamic State, in the same way as with Hamas, uh, in the same way as with uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Their purpose was blood spilling, brutality, murder and destruction. Richard, uh, now that uh, Israel has taken control back of its own borders, its own country, it's uh, managed to kill between 16 and 1700 terrorists who were in Israel, which, you know, these numbers are being updated daily, which gives you a, a, a sense of the magnitude of the invasion. I mean, the invasion was at least 3000, 3000 terrorists in Israel. And I think I believe the number is unprecedented in modern military history or modern the history of terrorism, if I'm not mistaken. Let's remember that 9-11 was eight, were, were eight to 10 terrorists on uh, four different uh, Boeing 7, 747 and 737 airlines that managed to kill 3,900 people. And here you have 3,000 uh, 3, uh, terrorists who uh, ultimately they killed uh, 1,400 people. But frankly, if, if the, the heroism by women and men uh, in Israel had not taken place, it, it would have been thousands more. There's, there's one thing that I would, um, I, I, two things I'd say about that. First of all, this was unprecedented. We haven't seen, we haven't seen a terrorist attack against any Western country on this scale ever in history. Mm. And you mentioned 9-11. When you compare the populations of Israel and the United States, this was the equivalent of 10 to 15 9 11s. It was that big, that, uh, that order of magnitude. Uh, and I think it's important for people to bear that in mind. The other thing, the other point I would make on this is very clearly a failure of intelligence and reaction by the Israelis. Uh, and, and that's obviously not something that I believe we should dwell on now. But we should, what we should dwell on, I think, is the pure, undiluted heroism of so many IDF officers, IDF soldiers, and ordinary civilians who fought back, who eventually killed 1,500 of the terrorists that came across into Israel. And that, I think, there is, I've heard so many incredible stories of retired generals, ordinary soldiers, ordinary civilians fighting and sometimes losing their lives in order to save the civilian population that was attacked by Hamas. So I think we should we should accept the, the failures that occurred, and obviously that will be looked into, but we should not forget the, the extraordinary heroism and fighting skill of the uh, IDF soldiers and retired soldiers and uh, members of the civilian population who, who took it into their hands, often without orders, without instructions, without any real knowledge of what was happening on the ground, to go in and, and kill as many of them as they could. Richard, we're now in day nine. The tides have turned. The Israeli Air Force is in full control uh, of the airspace uh, above Gaza, of course, and they are I inflicting uh, substantial damage on all of the uh, Hamas uh, headquarters. And they have the headquarters of a conventional army, not just a terror force. I mean, they've got divisions, uh, platoons, divisions. They've got intelligence headquarters. They've got, uh, you know, uh, training bases, training bases, ammunition supplies, depots, command centers. Exactly, command centers. Uh, and now, it, it, we all of us have been watching and participating in interviews uh, here and abroad, and per a particular concern. And you know, we at the Jerusalem Center, as you know, Richard, we're, we're particularly invested in Israel's international image and in, in inter Israel's international profile and position because its legitimacy as a nation state among the family of nations has increasingly come into question and has been, uh, has been wounded in past years because of 
the behavior uh, of, of Hamas uh, and the, uh, the disinformation campaign, the propaganda campaign of the Palestinian Authority, other PLO actors and the Hamas, and, and I must say Israel's less than ideal uh, actions on the, on the level of uh, winning hearts and minds in the international community, which we in the J at the JCPA have tried to supplement and uh, really uh, take a lead in fighting the disinformation campaign. Now the disinformation campaign is, is stating that Israel targets children in Gaza, that Israel's causing mass casualties in Gaza, that Israel's turning off the electricity and the water, which we have. And, and can you help us create some context on the humanitarian front, uh, Israel's rights to turn off water and electricity, which we had no obligation to maintain from the, from the moment we left uh, the moment we left Gaza as the legal uh, administrator or occupier, if you will, of the uh, uh, of Gaza uh, back in uh, 2005, we left lock, stock and barrel and that there are people saying today that Israel's turning off the electricity and the water is a war crime. I have to say that the reaction of much of the international media, not all of it, but much of the international media has been entirely predictable. I, I did. I did harbour a small hope that the, the sheer horror of what had happened at the weekend would temper some of the anti-Israel propaganda that permeates so much of the media. Particularly, I'm particularly thinking of the British media, but I'm sure it applies to much of the American media as well and other countries. But no, there was none of that. Right from day one, we got the same anti-Israel propaganda, starting off with. The suggestion that the reason this happened was not so much Hamas to blame, but the way that Israel treated Palestinians, which led to boiling up rage, uh, being uh, effectively discharged by this brutality. It was that level of morality and and uh, and, and depraved propaganda. Uh, I didn't really think it would occur at that stage. I, I had every confidence that once Israel began to fight back as it's been doing, as you've described, um, we'd, we'd see the, the ugly head of anti-Israel propaganda re-emerging, and indeed we have seen that. The, uh, I've, I've, had, I've done numerous interviews in the last few days with reporters and with presenters who, their automatic default position is whatever Israel does, it's gonna be a war crime. The reality is the total opposite of that. I've, ob I've observed, been present in Israel for um, for pretty much all of the Gaza conflicts, and and I've looked particularly closely at the way in which Israel does works to uh, prevent the loss of innocent lives on the battlefield. And there is no country in the world, and that includes today with the fighting that's going on in Gaza, no country in the world that takes such great pains and such effective steps to prevent the loss of life on of civilian life on the battlefield, as Israel does. And it's not just me that's saying that. I've been over here with uh, retired former generals from countries around the world who came to exactly the same conclusion objectively. Uh, the United States uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff a few years ago sent his officers out after a previous Gaza conflict to learn what they could from the Israelis about how to prevent the loss of civilian life on the battlefield. And the, the reality is, you know, you, you, you see, I did an interview today on the BBC where I was being told that there were X thousands, hundreds killed so far in the conflict, civilians killed. And what, what, the, what is being quoted here is Hamas. It's the Gaza medical authorities which are controlled by Hamas. So any figures for civilian deaths should be tempered by the knowledge that this is Hamas, and Hamas's purpose is to uh, to, to inspire anti-Israel propaganda around the world, and they are very, very successful at doing that. So it's it's it, that is the start point that Israel's in the wrong. The reality is that where possible, where, wherever possible, Israel warns civilians to get out of the way of a target area to leave a apartment block, say, or to leave another building that's going to be targeted. Very often, as you mentioned earlier on at the beginning, that Hamas in the past have stopped civilians from leaving areas when they've been warned to do so in order that they get killed. Because this is, um, 
Hamas's overall strategy, the reason they carry out these attacks, the reason they have fired rockets into Israel, the reason they've uh, dug attack tunnels into Israel, the reason they carried out these attacks at the weekend, yes, of course, they want to kill as many Jews as they can find. But their strategic overview is that they want to act in a way which will force Israel to respond and defend its own people. And they know that Israel's response is going to result in the deaths of innocent civilians because Hamas fights from within the civilian population. If you could call them an army, which I wouldn't, but if you did, you'd say they were the only army in history that has deliberately attempted to get their enemies to kill their own people, the people that they're supposed to be protecting. That is what it's all about. So no matter what measures the IDF takes, and they take extraordinary measures, it's impossible, it's impossible to deal with this problem without civilians dying. And, uh, if, you know, the, the, there are two options, I, I would suggest. One is you can say, we don't want any civilians to die. We'll make sure no civilians die. And the way to do that is to leave Hamas in Gaza, to let Hamas continue firing rockets, let Hamas rebuild themselves to the extent that they can carry out further atrocities as, as they did at the weekend. We, that's that's an option. Of course, it's an option. It's not an option any sane human being would take. The other option is to say we can deal with this, but the only way we're going to deal with it, in in order to destroy Hamas, get rid of their capability, remove the threat from Israel, is re recognizing and acknowledging that civilians are going to die, and it's unfortunate. It's tragic. The IDF commanders and soldiers who are responsible for the operations, many of whom I know and have spoken to frequently. It's the last thing they want to do. It's the last thing they want to do. But there is no other option. And when you talk about, um, when people talk as they have to me on the media about negotiating with, having a negotiated solution, a political solution, a, an organization that has one goal, as I mentioned, which is to kill Jews in Israel and around the world and destroy the state of Israel. What's the compromise with that? Is Israel expected to compromise and say, okay, well, we'll let you kill half of our population? Or are they going to, uh, of course, say, no, you're not going to do that. We will stop you however we need to, and it will involve the loss of life. Final point I'd make on this is that this is not against the Geneva Convention. The laws of war allow, explicitly allow, for military forces to attack targets where there are civilians present. As long as they don't deliberately attack civilians, and as long as they do everything they can to distinguish between civilians and military targets, and as long as they do what they can to warn them, then it is not a war crime, which uh, Israel has been accused of, including in an interview I gave today. And I've heard some preposterous statements from the United Nations, former UN diplomats as well, saying that Israel's instructions to uh, Gaza civilians to leave the north of the Gaza Strip and head south to a place where it's going to be safer is a war crime. It, and, and people have referred to it to me as forcible dislocation of a civilian population. It is the opposite of that. It is conforming to the laws of war, where a country that's carrying out operations is obliged to do their best to get the civilian population to move. That is also an obligation on Hamas. Hamas are obliged to move the civilians out of an area where they're going to attack from. They're obliged to do that. What do Hamas do? They do the opposite. They make sure they stay there. They try and get them killed. Yeah. And uh, uh, what we're also seeing now in the international propaganda uh, parade is a very confusing site, which is what they call the Free Palestine Campaign. And what we'd like to bring as part of our responsibility of creating context, pursuing perspective, and uh, creating really a broad analysis and assessment. And we've said this on, I said this on Fox, we've said it on CNN, we've said it on other networks. When you see people, thousands of people in the UK, in the United States, North America, say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free or free Palestine, or I'm with Gaza, they are basically, uh, they're basically committing a, a clarion call for the additional murder 
of Jews in Israel, because when they use that language, which is almost like Soviet language, you know, the Soviets used language like justice, equality, and freedom uh, as they were murdering millions of their own. Uh, this whole free Palestine campaign is a campaign to support the Hamas, is a campaign to continue the massacre of Jews. That's what the freedom means. It's freedom from Jews. And I, it's important for our, our uh, family and friends and colleagues who are with us on this briefing and further briefings to be very clear about what that means. I, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, the, 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 the term from the river to the sea, which is chanted at so many university campuses in so many protests and demonstrations around the world, means only one thing, the destruction of Israel. It means that, that the, the, the territory between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea will be free of Jews. That's what their objective is. That's what's specified in their charter. And people who, chant, who go around chanting that, many of them don't even realize that's what they're calling for because they, they, they're given throwaway lines, they're given lines to take, and they're given songs to sing. And what they don't probably don't realize is that by doing this, in some cases, in many cases, they do realize is that they also have blood on their hands by, by taking part in these effectively anti-Israel protests. They're not pro-Palestine. Every I'm pro-Palestinian. Any right thinking person is pro-Palestinian in terms of what not wanting to see Palestinians suffer or killed. But this is anti-Israel rather than pro-Palestinian. And those people who take part in these demonstrations, and I saw an Islamic State flag in a picture being in London yesterday being waved as part of the protests. These people are supporting and encouraging Hamas in what they want to do. And that it's not just protesters and demonstrators, it's university professors, it's students at universities, mainly at peace studies departments and, and, and similar things to that. And, and United Nations Human Rights Council's investigations in which they, 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 they universally condemn Israel. They vilify Israel. They seek to have Israel's delegitimization. And what, what's, the, what's the result of that? The result of that is it's encouraging the Palestinian terrorists to keep going, to do more of what they did before. Every time the United Nations Human Rights Council does a so-called investigation and finds Israel guilty of war crimes, which it does frequently, every time they do that, they're setting up for the next round of violence. And to be honest, Israel has suffered greatly from what happened, and particularly at the weekend. But Israel, Israelis, citizens of Sterot, for example, who are sent all the time, sent scurrying into their air raid shelters, men, women, children, uh, they're suffering. And Israel, many Israelis are suffering as a result of what Hamas has done in Gaza, even if you put aside the massacres at the weekend. But the people who suffer most, the people who are suffering above all else, are the Palestinian people in Gaza. They are held captive by Hamas. The funds that had given billions of dollars of funds given by the international community for the welfare and well-being and prosperity of Hamas, of, of Gaza citizens. That money goes normally to two places, one of two places. One is to, to find weapons, to dig tunnels, to, to find other means of attacking Israel. And the other place it goes to is in the pockets of the terrorist leaders themselves, who are among the wealthiest terrorists in the world. So, Richard, I, I think what, what you said there was exactly right. I think not many people know and understand that there are tens of thousands, if not even hundreds of thousands of Israelis that have been forced out of their homes, forced uh, uh, to flee the border areas. As we're talking now, there are more uh, mortars and rockets landing on Nachal Oz on that, on that southern area of the border with Gaza. Give us a little bit of, of, of a perspective, what it means to be in that situation. Put yourself, explain to our audience, in, in Israel's situation, you're, you're uh, um, obviously fighting in Afghanistan. Um, there, there was a war tens of thousands of kilometers away from the home base, no real danger posed to the home front, whereas Israel is fighting at the same time, we're, we're in that constant war situation. What does that mean for our, our decision-making process? How quickly we have to respond, how quickly we have to move uh, um, to eliminate that danger? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 very different from fighting thousands of miles away from home against a threat that that could and and often did transpire or transpose itself onto the population at home. But it's very it's very very different to when you're actually literally fighting for your family, for your fellow countrymen, for their homes within a stone throw of of uh, the Gaza Strip. It's a very different form of war and. The soldiers, the IDF soldiers that I've met uh, on the border with Gaza and on the border with Lebanon are absolutely, they, they know what they're getting themselves into. These are not stupid people. They recognize they're fighting an enemy that is extremely dangerous. And that by going into the Gaza Strip, if they're ordered in, they will stand a very good chance of getting killed. I hope not too great a chance. But they're risking, they're putting their lives on the line for their own families. Yet they are absolutely to a man and woman, every single person I spoke to, I've spoken to, I've spoken to many soldiers, absolutely understand what they're doing, absolutely committed to defending their people, and 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 in the full knowledge that they might be dead tomorrow. So I think that's that's a, a major difference between, um, you know, and, and a major motivation for people, for young men and women who know that they're literally on the doorstep defending their houses. And that came graphically home uh, over the weekend, last weekend. Absolutely. It, it, uh, Richard, um, I want to just uh, bring you up to date. I know you know some of this, but in order to effectively battle the misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, propaganda, we've established a, a, a war room uh, to fight Hamas, Iran uh, disinformation, Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, with a permanent Arabic, Farsi, and English communication center, uh, which which has a branch abroad. It has a branch here uh, in Israel. We're we're establishing in the Jerusalem Center, physically right here, um, a a major podcast, video cast with uh, Arab Muslims, Arab Christians, Jew, uh, Jewish, uh, Israeli speaking, Arab Arabic speakers and Farsi speakers. Uh, and uh, our uh, strategy here is to fight in the Arabic language and in the Farsi language uh, across social networks so that um, it's, not just, it's not just we who are making these counterclaims against this horrendous uh, propaganda, but actually we have help from scores of uh, uh, men and women of goodwill in the Arab world who are actually working with us, uh, journalists, commentators, influencers, uh, who really want to, believe it or not, they want to get the truth out. They're sick and tired of the Iranian regime, uh, and they're sick and tired of uh, years of what they understand to be propaganda. They are sons and daughters of the new democratization of communications and the internet and online uh, networks. Uh, and and so that that's what, it's a major project and initiative of the Jerusalem Center now going forward. Uh, and we've received very good and very positive feedback from Arab countries that even don't have relations uh, with Israel. So I, I think we, we, we're, we're hoping that this sort of unusual initiative will bear fruit in the West uh, as the West uh, people in the West will start seeing Arab journalists and Farsi journalists saying things that many journalists in the Western world are afraid to say or don't want to say. I, I, I think it's so important, Dan, that work. And let's not forget that one of the, I think, uh, in my estimation, one of the major reasons why Hamas, directed by Iran, decided to launch this attack now in terms of timing rather than necessarily uh, the way it was done. I think the, the, um, one of the overwhelming reasons for that was that uh, they, they're deeply worried about the peace process, the, the potential for a normalization of relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, which is which is very concerning for them because, of course, that helps to isolate uh, the the you know the Palestinian terrorist cause. And so, uh, you know, the, the 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 closer the closer that was getting, the more problematic it was coming for them, and above all, it was becoming more problematic for Iran. And Iran, of course, as we know, has their hand on the tiller in this whole conflict. Absolutely. Um, Richard, if we can go to just a few questions, there's some uh, good questions here. One is, is just a reminder, and I, I actually agree with this uh, anonymous 
Anonymous attendee participant said, oh, be careful not to say turn off the water, understanding that Israel's water to Gaza is only approximately 10% of the of the total supply. I don't know if that I number... I think it's even less. I think it's only 8%. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's a very little amount. Yeah, it's a small amount, so it's important that uh, uh, we, we don't uh, take full responsibility for the supply of water when the vast majority of water comes from their own desalinization and other sources. The same is also true, Dan, for, for the electricity, much of Gaza's electricity. Um, whilst it was provided by Israel, some of it comes, still comes, yeah. comes from Egypt, and they have their own source of electricity, yeah. generators that they were already prepared because of previous attacks. So all these claims about hospitals closing down and everything else is just a... Um, um, not a reflection of yeah. the reality. Then, then there's a question, Richard, uh, that, that's come up in uh, that, uh, you know, how do you uh, find a solution to this conflict in the long term? No approach has worked thus far. What needs to happen, according to the questioner, to drive this to a two state solution once and for all? Our view at the Jerusalem Center is that what the Hamas ISIS has proved now is there really is no two state solution uh, and that that there ha there's going to be another diplomatic political a strategic pathway to um, uh, to enable the Palestinians in Gaza to live in dignity and in freedom and autonomy. But the idea of having an independent state, we would be setting up for another mass, uh, another massacre as and even more so in, in the uh, in the topographical, uh, critically topographically important uh, Judea and Samaria, where there's, you know, the the Judea and Samaria and Hill Ridge is thirty two hundred feet. Uh, above uh, sea level, and he who he or she who controls the high ground in the West Bank controls all of the uh, strategic advantage over Ben Gurion Airport and the Mediterranean coast cities. The, a a two-state solution was never going to be an option. It was an impossibility, and I think, if anything, this, as you as you sort of suggested, these latest attacks by Hamas have actually put the final nail in the coffin of any two-state solution. Now, it may be possible for there to be greater autonomy in, let's say, in Judea and Samaria than there is now. That may be a possibility, depending on how uh, negotiations work out. But yeah. it can never be a possibility that there can be a state adjacent to Israel in Judea and Samaria that is not under Israel's security control. We've seen what happened in Gaza. Uh, we've seen what happened not just at the weekend. We've seen numerous uh, aggression against, attacks against Israel uh, when Israel is not actually present and controlling the security. Now, that would happen without a shadow of a doubt inside Judea and Samaria if Israel left Judea and Samaria. So it cannot, cannot possibly uh, allow anyone else, whether it, even if it was an international organization, it can allow no one else apart from Israel to control Judea and Samaria. And when it comes to the longer term perspective on, um, on Gaza, <laughs> Hamas is the government of Gaza. Israel is set on destroying Hamas. Therefore, Hamas, uh, Gaza will have no government. Somebody's got to govern it when it emerges from this war, hopefully without Hamas or Islamic Jihad or PFLP. Somebody's got to govern it. Now, the, there are two possibilities. One is that it could be governed potentially by some kind of international body. I think it's unlikely, and I don't know who it would be. And the second is that it's governed by Israel. And, and therefore, I think it's possible, and I don't know this for sure at all, but I think it's possible we could see the IDF in Gaza and in control of Gaza for the foreseeable future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, Without question. As we, I see that Harold Rode... And this question as well. Okay, we'll see Harold Rose has raised his hand. I think you have to send it into the chat, uh, Harold, a question uh, because of the uh, the system we have uh, here, the webcast system is not um, is not uh, a given to people asking questions or making comments uh, uh, orally. Uh, the, the question above, this is just two more questions and we'll end. Um, uh, clearly, there's no. Uh, where are we here? No, this one. Yeah, go ahead and read it. Why doesn't the fact that Hamas is killing its own people uh, while they're fleeing is a, why isn't it being reported by the the world's media? Um, the world needs to know that. Well, the world needs to know also that of the one in every four Hamas rockets falls in the Gaza Strip and kills Palestinians. That's the that's part of the death toll. Is the Hamas homemade rockets killing their own people? It's not only preventing the people from fleeing, fleeing southwards, 
which is obviously endangering their lives and, and, and getting them killed, but also actively killing uh, um, their own people. Um, so that's the, the answer to that question. We wish, uh, um, obviously, that uh, the media and the international media would report on this more extensively and provide those figures. Mostly it's hidden with uh, um, the international NGOs really completely ignoring the fact that all of the statistics we have point to the fact that one in four, one in four missiles. So if you've had 5,000 missiles, rockets shot, ro rocket shot at Israel over the last uh, um, nine days, 1,200 approximately have fallen in the Gaza Strip itself. And that's something which, again, the international media tends to uh, tends to ignore. Harold Rhodes, uh, a comment. Uh, he wants to talk about why neither Hamas or nor Abu Mazen or Mahmoud Abbas can what? Can what? What do we want to know? Can, uh, uh, can recognize Israel? Can recognize Israel. They're not, neither is able to recognize anything uh, close to uh, Israel. That's why, you know, I think Richard's made this point before, uh, just to sum up our uh, uh, compelling, engaging talk for the last 45 minutes, is that Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, their rhetoric does not differ substantively from the Hamas rhetoric. They haven't, they haven't sent out teams to mass murder children, uh, but they certainly finance those who mass murder children. Mahmoud Abbas has still not condemned, Dan, just as a reminder, Mahmoud Abbas has still not condemned the slaughter of last week. He, uh, um, he continues on with the same rhetoric he always ha has as he, as he condemns the killing of civilians on both sides, as if there's some type of uh, a parallel between our children that have been butchered and the terrorists who were killed in Gaza. That's his, his outlook. And uh, um, that's why he continues also with his financial rewards to the terrorists. Um, that's his outlook. And like maybe the, the continuation of Harold's question was, why can neither Hamas nor Abu Mazen be differentiated from ISIS? Um, I think that uh, speaks for itself. Oh, no, what Harold wanted to say, Richard, you can, uh, this, he, he finished, Harold finished the sentences. He gave it to us in two uh, uh, payments. Uh, and the second half of the sentence is what, what is the, the reason uh, within an Islamic context why Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas cannot, uh, uh, cannot resolve anything with Israel? He, he, I mean, Harold wants to say, as an Islamic scholar, yeah. that, that it's rooted in Islam, the impossibility of making peace with Israel. As Hamas's charter also specifically says, all of Israel is Islamic waqf. No one has the right or the jurisdiction to give it to the control of anyone else. That's the, the clearest expression um, of, uh, the, of, of, of part of the denial of Israel's right to exist. No one can ever make peace with Hamas. They aren't, they aren't, a, 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 a te they aren't yeah. an organization that recognizes us, and, and so you can't. Yeah, you Richard, can't your final that. observation, your final comments uh, for this afternoon's discussion. Thank you very much. I've, I've uh, enjoyed taking part in it, even if you may not have enjoyed seeing me driving around Israel. But um, I think w what, I, what I would say is that the Prime Minister of Israel is going to be faced with a, a, a significant, he's already faced with massive dilemmas. He's going to be faced with uh, great dilemmas in the coming days. And one of, the, one of them is, uh, you know, as I've witnessed myself up on the Lebanon border today, um, Hezbollah, I think, has been carrying out the most intensive attack campaign against Israel since the second uh, Lebanon war. Now, at some point it may be, and it may be when, if and when Israel goes into Gaza, they may be faced with uh, a war on the northern front as well. And Israel is then in the position of having to fight on two fronts, which is going to be, I think, doable for Israel. Israel's prepared for that, but it's going to be tough. There's no question about that. Um, and the second big dilemma, I think, that President, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to face is the United States of America. As this conflict unfolds, are, is America going to remain as steadfast as they've been so far? We, we don't know. We don't know that. I would be slightly pessimistic about at what point the President of the United States decides to start exerting pressure on Israel to, to end its operations in Gaza. And, and that will not be a problem if it's after Hamas is destroyed, of course. And there'll be no reason to continue in that circumstance. But if pressure is put on Israel to cease operations before they've achieved their mission, 
that is a huge problem for Israel because you know, you, it's not just a situation where you can say Israel is a sovereign country, it can do what it wants. Israel has such a close and not, I wouldn't say totally dependent relationship with the US, but must maintain its relationships with the US, almost come what may. And that, I think, puts the prime minister in a difficult position. So we, we, we watch that with great closeness. And of course, the many of the anti-Israel media, many uh, anti-Israel diplomats, and, and activists are hoping to pressure, uh, and, and the demonstrations taking place uh, are hoping to pressure the president of the United States, other other world leaders, to to, to essentially say, well, that, that, you know, we're, we're paying a high price now, so let's uh, let's try and stop Israel from carrying on what it's got to do, and 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 that that is that could be a big problem for the future. Yes, thanks you for that uh, warning and uh, foresight. We look forward to seeing you again during your visit here, Richard, and thanks for so much, so much of your time. We were very impressed at the, 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 the level of driving skill that you were able to <laughs> exercise while offering deep analysis. It's, a, it's, quite, it's, a, it's very skilled, and thank you for your- I think, uh, I, think, I, think, I think many British people might, who saw me sitting on the right-hand side of the car might have wondered about that, but- Right, they might have actually thought you were driving. Yeah, right. And in, in Britain, of course, we drive on the correct side of the road, where here in Israel, like in the United States, they drive on the wrong side of the road. That's right. It, you know, the Brits haven't gotten over the mandate yet. And so we keep getting, <laughs> we get digged. There's digs. Great, Richard. I look forward to seeing the you. Americans when... haven't learned to speak English either. That's right. That's the point. <laughs> I know. We can't, can't do everything. And, uh, and thank you to our colleagues and friends abroad. We would, uh, we, we deeply need your, uh, your support. Uh, if you you can uh, email us at uh, diker at jcpa.org or Maurice, Maurice. M-A-U-R-I-C-E. M-A-U-R-I-C-E at jcpa.org. If you can uh, if you can help us uh, support us financially on the on this brand, on this uh, extraordinary important concept of the Arabic, Parsi and English uh, communication center, we'd be deeply grateful. We're fighting the dis the disinformation war. And we're we're uh, we're really uh, the head of the spear on 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 trying to win hearts and minds in the West. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow at four o'clock. We'll have Fiamma Nierenstein, uh, who is uh, one of the great European experts, European Israeli experts in anti-Semitism, talking about that the view of of uh, Hamas, ISIS, and classic anti-Semitism uh, themes to, to keep in mind. So we'll see everybody tomorrow, and God bless, and have a safe and sound. Uh, day today across the seas in North America or in Europe, wherever you are. Nice to see you, everyone. Goodbye. It's hard to keep it to half an hour when you have someone like Richard is making all these amazing